Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, we're going to learn how to stabilize a wine before putting it in a bottle. If you want to learn more about winemaking, make sure to also check out my website, smartwinemaking.com, and swing by my Patreon page, patreon.com slash makewine. Now, you may have heard winemakers say something like, oh, make sure your wine is stable before bottling it. And that's a really pretty broad term and can be a little bit confusing as a new winemaker as to what does that really mean that you have to do? Well, there's kind of a few different types of stability, some being a little bit more important than others. The first being microbial stability, which is going to be, you know, making sure it doesn't try to re-ferment in the bottle or making sure it doesn't try to go through malolactic fermentation in the bottle. There's going to be cold stability, which is going to be making sure you don't get a pile of kind of sandy looking crystals in the bottom of a bottle. And you've probably seen this not only from some of your homemade wines, but you'll surprisingly often see this from a store-bought wine. And then there's going to be things like trying to make sure that you don't get a, a haze in that wine. Now, I can make this as simple or as confusing as possible, and I'm going to try to keep it relatively easy to digest. So I'm going to go through a couple types of wine. We'll start with how would I make a red wine and make sure that that wine is stable? And then we'll do something on the complete opposite spectrum. How would I make something like a, a sweet fruity wine? And again, make sure that it's stable, make sure you're not blowing corks off or you're not um, gonna present a wine that has a big pile of crystals on the bottom. A red wine is gonna be, I don't know if I would say maybe a little bit easier to stabilize because you're usually bottling these dry and you're usually going to put these through malolactic fermentation rather than actually doing the opposite and trying to prevent malolactic fermentation. That's because you're in these cases usually looking for something a little bit more savory, um, buttery versus something that's really, really fruity like imagine a, um, a Concord wine. So to assure stability in a red wine, the first thing I'm gonna do really early on is I'm gonna use some sort of enzyme to break down the pectin. So something that can happen in you know, a red wine or a white wine is you can get something called a pectin haze. So by using a pectic enzyme or a lalzyme or one of those enzymes that kind of just helps to break down the fruit and break down that pectin, you're virtually eliminating the risk of having a pectin haze. So we'll start there. If you didn't do this, and if you end up with a haze later on, you can still add pectic enzyme. It's just that it's not very effective when there's actually alcohol in the wine. So you're gonna have to add a much higher dose than what the package might say that you're gonna wanna add. Next thing I'll do usually with a red wine is just try to make sure that it ferments all the way dry. So if you're using a hydrometer, um, you might wanna see a number like 0.996, that's 0.996, um, or even lower, or if you're working on the brick scale, somewhere like negative one, negative 1.5, 1 and that's gonna usually indicate that you've consumed mostly all of those sugars with the yeast. And some ways to kind of assure that you're gonna go dry is to Make sure the wine doesn't get too cold during the end of fermentation. Try to keep it above 70 degrees Fahrenheit for a red wine. Um, and try to give it kind of a, a swirl every day. Um, usually you're fermenting red wines on the grape skins. So you're gonna be do, doing something called a punch down. We're kind of submerging those skins two to three times a day. So usually it's gonna keep on chugging along with the fermentation. You also want to make sure you have proper nutrition. So use um, a good yeast nutrient. Some people would just use a simple DAP, diammonium phosphate. That's pretty good, but the yeast will consume that like it's candy. So you might actually use up all that nitrogen before you get to the end of fermentation. I like to use a little bit of DAP, but also a little bit of something more um, with a little bit 
more slowly available nitrogens like Fermaid K. So now we've got a dry wine, but there's still another fermentation that can happen, and that is malolactic fermentation when this bacteria um, converts malic acid into lactic acid. It kind of makes it a little bit less tart, a little bit more um, kind of smooth, and um, it gives a little bit of something called diacetyl, which can make, which can make it a little bit buttery. And I'm going to do this almost always on a red wine. And what I'll do to it, it's, well, first of all, it's probably going to try to do this naturally. It's generally just present on the grape skins. If you're making it from a kit, that isn't the case. But if you're making a red wine in the traditional way, which I highly, highly recommend, which is from whole grapes, you're just going to get a much fuller bodied, better red wine. But in that case, the malolactic bacteria is already probably there. But normally I'll actually add my own malolactic culture and I'll choose one that's really reliable. I wanna make sure that that thing rushes all the way through. Um, one that I like to use is Christian Hansen CH16. That stuff's really very um, reliable. And also what you'll find when using these these cultures of malolactic bacteria that have kind of been chosen or isolated from nature to be ones that are reliable is that you'll end up with lower tyramine, um, histidine, these things that are in the histamine family. So if you're the kind of person that gets a headache from red wine or maybe you get stuffed up, there's a lot of uncertainty as to what causes that. But Reducing those histamines certainly could help you out in that situation. So choosing a, your own malolactic culture, keeping that wine um, somewhere in the range of the high 60s Fahrenheit to about 70 Fahrenheit during malolactic fermentation, and also hydrating that malolactic culture with a malolactic nutrient like Opti ML. And if you do all these things, you should, you should have a complete malolactic fermentation. Um, if you've got a wine that you know is going to be pretty high alcohol content, something like 14 and a half or higher, you may actually want to consider adding that malolactic culture a little bit early um, before fermentation is over to assure that it is capable of running through and getting kicked off before the alcohol level really gets too high. That will create a teeny tiny bit of volatile acidity, but I've never seen this to be a problem. Like I've never been able to perceive it later on. It's such a subtle, subtle amount. It might actually, if anything, make that wine just seem a little bit more fruity. Next in a red wine, um, you're gonna want to make sure that it's cold stable. Some people might also call this tartrate stable. And what you're really doing is making sure that if there's a super saturation of potassium bitartrate, also known as cream of tartar, something that's a byproduct of winemaking, that you're making sure that those crystals fall out of solution before that ever gets to the bottle. And to encourage that to happen, you're gonna to wanna to chill that wine. You can chill it to somewhere like 40 degrees for a long period of time, something like a month, or you can chill it even colder. I often will chill it somewhere around 27 degrees, which generally will still won't freeze with the red wine because you've got this alcohol. But at a temperature of about 27 degrees, you can usually drop out all that potassium bitartrate in about five days usually. You could seed it with um, some potassium bitartrate to try to kick it off, but I've never really seen an issue if you're actually gonna go ahead and cold stabilize it. This will make sure that that wine is cold stable. You, the reality with a red wine is you don't really have to be as cold stable as something like a white wine because you're not actually serving it cold. So you're not gonna later add it to the fridge. 
which would be an event that could promote the dropping out of all those little crystals. With a red wine too, um, you technically could get some other hazes. You could get a copper haze, you could get a ferric haze. I would say these are really, really rare. And that's because red wine has a lot of tannin, which in itself can kind of act as a fining agent. So usually I don't really have to worry about that. I don't usually have to worry about any sort of fining, whether it be bentonite or gelatin. I just normally don't do it. And that's because I'm trying to retain as much kind of body and structure in these red wines. It's just a stylistic thing that I like to do. I like to make a big red wine. Next though, you are going to want to, I would say make sure that the wine is microbially, microbially stable, but because the wine's already dry, you're not actually stabilizing against the yeast trying to re-ferment because the malolactic bacteria has already done its job too. You're not trying to stabilize against that. You're trying to stabilize against oxidative microbes. So um, that would be things like acetobacter or these acetic acid bacteria that will try to turn that wine into vinegar or oxidative byproducts, which is actually what in nature wine's gonna try to do. But as a winemaker, you're just trying to stop that from happening before we ever get there. So to do that, you're gonna use sulfur dioxide. This is a scary sounding thing. You'll see on a wine label contains sulfites, which is another word for sulfur dioxide, but it is natural. It's a natural byproduct of fermentations. It's just something that is relatively, I would say unstable. It wants to kind of oxidize away, go away. So you have to give it a little nudge and give it a little bit more sulfite so that, that those vinegar type bacteria don't try to spoil your wine for you. Um, the way you're gonna add this is in the form of potassium metabisulfite, which is a potassium salt that when added to water creates your SO2 or sulfur dioxide. You want to maintain a level of SO2 appropriate to make sure that those little um, bacteria can't do their job. So that's usually gonna be around 0.8 parts per million molecular SO2, or we can say 0.8 milligrams per liter. Those two terms are actually interchangeable. I kinda think it's a little bit easier to work in milligrams per liter. But what's even easier here, so you still have to do a calculation, is instead of talking in molecular SO2, you're gonna talk in free SO2 or free sulfur dioxide. So depending on the pH of the wine or how acidic that wine is, you're gonna need a different amount of sulfur dioxide. So I'll just use this time to plug pH meters. You should have a pH meter if you're a winemaker. If you plan on sticking with winemaking at all, get a pH meter. They're inexpensive. You can get a cheap one for like 20 bucks. You can get a pretty nice one for about $80. And if you're gonna stick with the hobby, I would definitely recommend the latter. So to achieve the right amount of free SO2, um, you're gonna go online, you're gonna find some charts. I can put a link to a chart that I have on my website, which will tell you how much free SO2 necessary to reach that 0.8 molecular SO2 level. Um, if you have a high pH, meaning a low acidity, you're gonna need a lot more than if you have a low pH or a really acidic wine. And that's because the acid itself does a pretty good job of holding back these little microbes. To make the calculation even more complicated, potassium metabisulfite is only about 57% SO2. So um, when you calculate how much you have to add, you again have to then multiply by 0.57. And I can give you kind of a cheater option. If you add two grams to six gallons, that adds about 50 parts per million free SO2. So you can scale up or down from there. And I'll give you one more cheat, which is that a quarter teaspoon of potassium metabisulfite is about two grams. So if you're just getting started, you might not have a scale. Um, you might not want to deal with all this math, 
that's kind of a good starting point. I personally, um, I would say because these wines I make, they're really pretty big on the tannin. I actually normally only add about two thirds of the recommended dose per those charts, which, give, which gives me closer to about 0.5 parts per million molecular. That's what I'll do for my red wines. For white wines, I'll stick to the charts. For fruit wines, I'll stick to the charts. So as complicated as that was, I hope you're able to follow for the most part what I did there to create a bottle stable red wine that will last for a really, really long time. Um, you could age this easily for five years, maybe 10 years. Now let's step into something like a sweet fruity wine. This wine here is, um, it's called Diamond. It's a Labrusca family grape and it is very fruity. So if you think like Welch's grape juice, that's how fruity this is gonna seem to you. That's kind of the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And we're gonna do things a little bit differently there because we're gonna bottle it sweet and we're also going to intentionally prevent malolactic fermentation. Um, the same is gonna apply for preventing a pectin haze. Um, you're still gonna wanna use your pectic enzyme and actually I would even say you're especially gonna wanna use it because these wines are clear. Um, you don't want this wine to have this hazy look to it. It's just, I don't know, maybe it's embarrassing if you give it out and it has a little bit of a haze to it. So start off ferment just as you normally would. Um, you have a couple of options as to how to retain the sugar in the wine. You can cold crash it where you actually intentionally stall that fermentation. I'd say that's a little bit more of an advanced technique or you can do the more simple and also really common technique of back sweetening that wine where you're gonna add sugar at the end. Um, I usually add in the form of simple syrup or invert sugar to back sweeten this wine. But here's where things start to get tricky. If you add a sugar to a wine, even if you think there's no yeast in there, there's probably a couple cells of yeast just hiding out in there that will almost certainly eventually try to re-ferment that wine, which means you're gonna be popping corks everywhere. You're gonna have shattered bottles and you're just gonna have a mess on your hands if this happens. So there's a couple things you're gonna have to do to prevent that. First, I mentioned um, that with this wine, I want to intentionally prevent malolactic fermentation. That's to kind of keep it really, really fruity. If you were to put a wine like this through malolactic fermentation, it's gonna be a whole different animal. It's gonna be more, more buttery, buttery than you probably would want. It would be like three times as buttery as a Chardonnay probably because there's just so much malic acid here. So to prevent malolactic fermentation, you're really gonna have to maintain those free sulfur dioxide levels, just like I talked about last time, but I will say the importance is much higher with a white wine, not only to prevent malolactic fermentation, but also to prevent oxidation, because these wines don't have nearly the protection. They, they have a little protection in the form of acid because they are higher acid, but they have very, very low tannin, which can also act as a pro protectant to some extent and scavenge oxygen. Normally what I'll do is after fermentation is complete, I'll add about two times the recommended amount of sulfur dioxide or potassium metabisulfite. And that sounds maybe extreme or maybe it sounds crazy, but what you'll find is that this stuff binds up pretty readily. It also oxidizes pretty readily. And if you were to test it, which in my case, I always will test it before bottle, you'll find that you started here and now you're somewhere down here. And if you end up starting at the minimum that you think you need, 
and now you end up at a third of the minimum, you're probably gonna go through malolactic fermentation and you're probably not gonna be happy with the result. So maintain your free SO2 levels. The next thing that's gonna be a little bit different um, with this wine because we're gonna bottle it sweet is you have to do something to prevent that um, yeast from trying to ferment that wine again. So in a winery, they have a couple of options that aren't readily available to a home winemaker. They can sterile filter. They might sterile filter right as it's going into the bottle. So there's no other sources of contamination. At home, it is really, really, really hard to effectively sterile filter. Some people might be wondering about pasteurization. You don't really want to pasteurize a wine. You do so much work to try to maintain all these fresh fruit aromas. So by heating that wine, you kind of transition to a cooked fruit, which is just not traditionally what you want to do with a wine. So normally we'll rule out pasteurization as an option. Um, something they'll often use at these wineries, whether they'll ever say it or not, is something called Velcrin, which is dimethyl dicarbonate, which essentially um, sterilizes the wine and then breaks down into CO2 and a minuscule bit of methanol, which sounds bad, but there's already a tiny bit in the wine. It's not really more than what you might normally find in the range of a wine. So that's something they might use as a way to sterilize the wine without actually filtering it. But here's what you're going to probably use, and it's going to be um, sorbic acid. Or the way we'll get that is going to be again in a potassium salt, which is potassium sorbate. So sorbic acid again is totally natural. It's found in some fruits out there. And what this does is it coats the yeast cell, which stops it from being able to bud. Um, so that's the way that a yeast replicates. It creates these little buds on the side that split off and create a new cell. Um, so you basically eliminate that possibility, but what it's not doing is eliminating what yeast is already there from fermenting. So before you were to add something like that, you also wanna make sure that that wine is crystal clear. If there's any haze whatsoever, there's a good chance that haze is yeast. And if there's enough that you can see a haze, there's probably enough yeast to actually actively ferment that. So make sure that the wine is crystal clear. Before you were to stir it up, make sure that you rack it off of any lees or any sediment on the bottom and add your potassium sorbate and then sweeten to your desired taste. You're especially gonna want to um, cold stabilize a white wine or a fruity fruit wine because you're usually gonna serve those cold. So in the process of putting it in the fridge later in bottle form, you're just gonna encourage those crystals to fall out. So you wanna make sure those crystals fall out before you were to get to that point where it's in the bottle. That pretty much covers it for stabilizing a wine. I know I just, might have thrown a lot of information at you. So if you want to rewatch this or check out some of my other resources, feel free. There's a couple types of stability I haven't talked about in detail, but they're also going to be very rare. And those are going to be the hazes that I mentioned. And usually the solution for hazes is going to be your fining agents, like your bentonites, your gelatins. I, I would say I almost never run into these things. Usually time will help solve a lot of that stuff. So if you're gonna to wait to bottle for you know, eight months to a year to a year and a half, usually not gonna to have to deal with that stuff. But if you ever do get a really stubborn haze, um, you can go ahead and use a fining agent, but to figure out which fining agent to use can be a little bit tricky. So what you can do is some little bench trials to figure that out, um, especially if you're working with a really big batch of wine, you can do some little half gallon bench trials to figure that out. I hope this helped you out. If you have any comments um, about anything I might have missed, make sure to mention it in the comment section below. Thanks for watching.